I'm filming this up at my cabin, so the lighting's not that good, and the sound is probably not that good, but I'm going to review episode seven of Rings of Power, which is also not that good. Um, I'm going to do it in a different way. I'm not going to go chronologically scene by scene. There will be a lot of spoilers, though, so I'm going to take one, you know, big, big chunks at a time, the storylines, because there are now three storylines. There's essentially Galadriel, Galadriel and Theo, the young boy who talks like this, he's one of those, you know, adolescence boys whose voice is just changing, so they got a voice that sounds a little like this. Um, <laughs> oh, we've all been there, guys. Um, and then the second one is uh, Khazad Doom, uh, Durin and Elrond. I'm not going to focus too much on that one. And the last is the Harfoots, the Harfeet, as I call them. So let's start with uh, Galadriel and Theo. The theme of this uh, review would have to be inconsistency. Inconsistency with uh, inconsistency with character, inconsistency with theme, with story, especially story. There are all sorts of illogical lapses, just, just sloppy editing, sloppy continuity. Um, <laughs> I just saw a review where someone pointed out that one of the characters after a fire has this big burn on his, his uh, neck until halfway through, and then it's not there. Uh, there's a lot of that sort of thing. But mostly it's inconsistency between episodes. For example, you'll have something that happens uh, in this seventh episode that completely directly contradicts something that happened a week ago, a week ago for us. But as far as the story goes, something that happened less than 24 hours before is completely different. Uh, let me give you one example of what I mean. The character Bronwyn, she is uh, falls victim to uh, the orc attack in episode six. She gets shot with two arrows, even though she only shows up with one. Uh, in the tavern where they're they're taking care of her. And this is not a minor wound. This is serious. She's got that arrow, comes right straight through her. They have to break it off and pull it out. And it's terrible, terrible pain with blood gushing out of her shoulder. And she lapses into what appears to be a coma and possibly death. The other characters are standing around with grief, welling up in their expressions, tears in their eyes, until suddenly <gasps> she comes back to life. Now she shows up 24 hours later. Hi, how you doing? To her son, hugs him, hugs him tightly with that shoulder wound that nearly killed her less than 24 hours ago. Okay, there you go, that sort of thing. So uh, the show opens with uh, the aftermath of the pyroclastic flow from a volcano which in any realistic world would kill every living thing within miles or that it touches. It's superheated air. Uh, now this is a fantasy, so okay, let, let's let them uh, have that. Um, Galadriel Awakens. Now here we go with some inconsistency. Last week, episode six, I talked about the fact that I counted the houses in the village as seen from a long shot with the caveat that there might be more houses around the corner. I counted three buildings, three buildings, okay? Presumably these three buildings were still there when the volcano erupts and everybody is in those little, the little village square uh, celebrating their victory over the orcs. Uh, the volcano erupts. Suddenly now they are scattered oh, far and wide. Nobody can find anyone else. They're all looking. Galadriel and Theo seem to be in another county altogether. Um, she finds Theo, the young boy, and um, Galadriel has some deep, meaningful chats with him. And at one point he says, have you ever killed an orc? And she says, many. And he goes, good. She says, don't use that word. And he's like, why not? And she says, Something along the lines of using a word like that, it damages your heart. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but it is a sentiment that Galadriel 
would never say. The Galadriel, the real Galadriel might from Professor Tolkien's work, but this Galadriel, who for six episodes has done nothing but hunt orcs with a single-minded vengeance, uh, just the day before, when Adar is her prisoner in the barn, she's like, I'm going to kill every single orc, and I'm going to do it in front of you, and then I'm going to make you watch. I mean, just uh, ruthless. Now she's like, no, don't say that, because it hurts our heart not to, oh my God. You know, consistency writers, this is the problem here with this kind of thing. There's a sense that the writers have not watched the previous episode or read the script for the previous episodes. Now, surely that's not true. I do notice that they seem to have a different writer for each episode and a different director. Too bad. You know, you all are in story meetings. You all have to sit and listen to, you know what the character is. Why would you do something, write something? It's like, you know, when I was 12, my cousin, my brother and I would go out in the woods and we'd come up with stories like what what would happen if a werewolf came out of that cave or or what would happen if a, a monster was in that tree? And we'd react to that and we'd come up with these things that we would do. But it didn't make any sense. There was, you know, there was no mention of a werewolf before. That's what they are doing. Uh, how about if we how about if we have this happen and then that happen with no regard for what's come before? No regard at all. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't. And so it makes us not believe it. I don't believe Galadriel feels that. I don't believe she thinks that. It makes no sense at all. <sighs> so, um, in this flow too, we also, uh, I'm going to keep some of the other characters there, Elendil and, uh, Isildur's missing. We know the horse is going to find him later, but I'm, I'm not going to get into that one, but it, it, here's one I like. Uh, the Queen Regent. Um, has been blinded by the sparks or the fire, the volcano somehow. And she's like, I don't, I don't want anyone. She's staring straight ahead. I don't want anyone to know. So you just walk ahead as if nothing's happened. The very next time we see her, she's wearing a blindfold. I don't want anyone to know I'm blind. Just make sure no one knows I'm blind. If you're going to say, I don't want anyone to know I'm blind, don't wear a blindfold as if you're going to be executed and asking for your last cigarette in two minutes. <laughs> um, finally, near the end, um, Galadriel uh, runs into Halbrand. She goes into a camp. Now, remember last week we talked about uh, the boats, the ships that were 55 feet long. I'm going to even go further. I'm going to say 70 feet, 70 feet long, three ships that supposedly carried 500 soldiers and their horses and all their armor. I don't believe it. I don't believe any of that. Those ships could have caught, carried anything like that. But now we find not only did they do that, they brought an entire encampment, meaning tents, tables, beds, cots, medical equipment, and it's all there. So all the townspeople that had been damaged and, and, and injured in the volcano explosion are now there. Um, and Theo meets his mother. <laughs> hug me, hug me close and tight where I was mortally wounded by that arrow because I don't feel it anymore. <sighs> and... Uh, Aaron Deere's there too. Aaron Deere, who I am going to guess is Theo's father. What do you think? Um, and then uh, Galadriel finds out that Halbrand's there. Halbrand. But she, first she talks to the queen. The queen who says, don't you have any pity on me? Pity our enemies because I'm going back to Numenor and I'm going to get my army and bring them back. Why didn't you bring them this time? You got to go all the way home, get your army again and come back and do it. You should have done it the first time. Okay, so now Galadriel goes back to the camp and they say something about, oh, the king. And what king? The king? And it's Halbrand. And she thought Halbrand was dead, but now she... And she takes one look at his wound. He's got a wound on his side. And she says, this wound needs elvish medicine. Just like Arwen in Fellowship of the Ring. When Frodo is stabbed by a Morgul blade which is deadly and affects him for the rest of his life. There's no Morgul blade here. 
How Brand's just been injured like everyone else. Something fell on him, or I don't know what exactly what happened, but he needs elvish medicine. Okay, how does he go get the elvish medicine? Do you imagine? If somebody has a wound requiring elvish medicine, what do you think they have to do? Hal Brand gets up out of bed, walks out of the tent. Everybody who did not know he was king yesterday is now like, Hail! Hail Hal Brand! Hail King! Uh, king... Halbrand gets up on a horse, and with Galadriel, he gallops, presumably for hundreds of miles to get the elvish medicine. My goodness, that's the kind of wound that needs hel elvish medicine? No, come on, man, just give him some, you know, Band-Aid and a shot of whiskey, and that ought to do it. Okay, let's move on from that whole storyline. We're going to go to Hazadum. And uh, this one, I'm not going to focus on too much. This is the dwarves and um, Elrond with the whole Mithril thing that uh, Durin the Fourth wants to give, give mine Mithril to give to the elves because the elves say that Mithril will keep them. They've just discovered that Mithril will prevent them from fading away and dying, which has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with Professor Tolkien and his lore. Nothing. Um and so my question about that is, why now? I mean, you've been around for centuries, elves. You just now discover that you need mithril to survive for this generation. It's not, it's not fading away forever. At one point, Elrond says, I need to go back and tell Gil Galad, the high king, that he's going to fade away and die. Basically, he's going to lose his kingdom. So you're going to fade away and die now. But if you didn't, if they didn't find Mithril, wouldn't you just fade away and die? Why now that they've just discovered it, do you discover that you need it to heal somehow? Illogical. Illogical. I don't believe it. That's a, that's a big problem in fantasy. If, you're, if your viewer does not believe it, you need to create a world that we believe. So there's a lot of arguing back and forth with Durin the third and Durin the fourth. I actually like the two Durins. That's uh, those are, I like I like the old guy especially. He's pretty uh, commanding, um, but in the end he throws a Malorn leaf through the hole in the rocks that his son opened to a vein of mithril, and the leaf floats down and catches on fire because that leaf awakened the Balrog. Not that the dwarves uh, delved too greedily and too deep. No. Well, I guess maybe. we could. Let's give them that. Opening up that vein of mithril awakened the Balrog. When, you know, Balrog doesn't do it. He just shows <laughs> And then that's it uh, for this episode. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the last one. And that is the Harfoots. The Harfeet. A lot of people love the Harfeet. Um, I'll tell you who doesn't love the Harfeet, and I think this is hilarious, and that is the media in Ireland. <laughs> they, uh, a few interviews have been conducted, and uh, to the shock and horror of the producers, some of the reporters from like the Irish Times go, um, can you tell us something? Why is it that the characters who are filthy live in hovels with grass in their hair, all have Irish accents. What is that? What's that all that about them? Uh, did we? Oh. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, let's move on from that. The dwarves are Scots. Um, the elves are British. So we've come to the Harfeet, the nomadic filthy uh, hobbit-like creatures. They are forerunners of hobbits. They have with them homeless Gandalf, I'm calling him. He looks like some homeless guy from Port Authority, but uh, supposedly, you know, I've heard theories that he might be Gandalf, but he's he's a simple soul who fell from a meteor. And uh, one of the girls, Nori, has sort of taken him under her wing. There's no consistency here either, because the last time we saw them, the uh, homeless Gandalf um, saved Nori and her friend from some wolves. And he did this by pounding the ground and the wolves scattered. And he was injured and he put his arm into water and ice started to climb up his arm. And Nori, not being the most intelligent little Harfoot, comes over and grabs his arm and ice starts climbing up her arm and she freaks out. <laughs> and uh, breaks away and runs away leaves her friend. 
no, uh, we, we, there's no follow through with that because now friend is back with them. Homeless Gandalf's with them is that that never happened. So that was just a little melodrama thrown in there just for the sake of it. Um, didn't have any meeting at all. But now they come to a grove that they've been on their way to a single apple orchard. And what do you think happened? Now, this apple orchard technically has to be hundreds of miles away from the volcano. It just is, because it's it. The, the, if you look at the map, it's it's far, far away. But a rock from that volcano came all that way and landed right on the grove, burning up the apple trees. So they're all these apples are still there, but they're all black with soot. Homeless Gandalf uh, goes up and hugs the tree and starts talking to it in an incantation, and things start to happen with the tree. And just as it's coming to life, one of the little Harfeet girls runs, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. Like maybe it's Nori's sister because they have, they share some um, family tendencies toward being annoying. Um, I'm going to interfere. Let me interfere. And a branch falls and almost kills her. But Nori saves him. And everyone looks at, at homeless Gandalf as if he did it on purpose. They all look at him like this, you know, the nightmare neighbor. and they banish him. This is a group of people who go through the forest chanting, everyone stays on the trail. Nobody walks alone. Nobody goes alone. Everybody stays on the trail. Nobody goes alone. And all they do is make sure people are thrown off the trail and have to go on by their side, banish them. The father, uh, Nori's father, broke his ankle, which by the way, seems to have miraculously healed because he's walking fine now. But uh, he broke his ankle. What's the what's the reaction of the rest of the Har feet? Well, put him in the back. <laughs> Abandon him. Everyone stay on the trail. Nobody walks alone. Unless you're hurt or injured or weak, then you're then you got to walk alone, and you're you're on your own. You're, we're gonna leave you to the wolves. It and it, without fail, this is I think the third time. So they throw homeless Gandalf out the third time. The first time he almost burned down their hut. Get rid of him. Second time, Nori with the 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 ice. Yeah, you run away. Now uh, he almost kills the interfering little girl who ran up to him. Um, oh, get out! Get out! It's your fault. Okay, fine. Now the three witches from Macbeth. I don't know what they are. Actually, this is. Mm, I don't. These are a little interesting. I do want to. Like I said last week, Adar is my favorite character because I don't know who he is. I don't know what he's planning, and I'm interested. I'm actually interested in what he is. I'm interested in what these three might be. I don't know. They're pretty sinister. And um, they come and they burn the uh, <coughs> Harfeet's, the Harfoot's uh, carts. And all the car <laughs> me, I'm like, mm, good. That was nice. Um, and uh, lo and behold, the grove has been rejuvenated. Obviously through Homeless Gandalf, has, his magic has worked. They didn't give it time. They threw him out before the magic worked. But now the magic works and they're like, ah, we need to go find that guy. So Nori's like, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go and find him. And you're not gonna go alone, says her friend. And then the father says this speech of, you know, we're har feet, we're har foots. We cannot kill a dragon. We cannot dig for gold, but we can do one thing better than any other creature in Middle Earth. We can stick together because we have hearts as big as our feet or bigger than our feet. Stick together. When have you people stuck together? You are sociopaths. I understand if you're in a situation that's quite treacherous, you're in, in a war zone, for example, where there's famine and everybody's in a desperate state and you have one weak member that tragically has to be left behind for the good of the whole. That could be necessary. And, and you know, certainly it has happened in times past. That's not the case here. They're on their way to an apple orchard. They're not starving. They know where they're going. Yes, the apple orchard's destroyed, but they it isn't destroyed before they get there. Why are they always throwing people out? Nobody walks alone. Everyone's staying on the trail except you. Get out. You got to get out of here. You're in the back. Um, and, and, and then they have a ceremony where they lovingly remember 
everyone they left behind. Mm. And then Malva, she's the wife of uh, the leader. I can't remember his name. Um, and she says, well, I'm going to go with them too. We need to all go with them. And the leader, the lead, the chief says, you know, Malva, the, the worst thing is, is that you are always proven right. I'm paraphrasing, but you are always proven right. No, she's not. She's never proven right. She's the most ruthless of them all. In fact, two episodes previous, she says, let's take the wheels off their cart so they can't follow. She doesn't even want to give them a chance to follow. When, when is she always right? Oh, insufferable. Insufferable. I know you want to make the women right always through this whole thing, which is fine if they are right, but she's not right. <laughs> If somebody said, why do you care so much? Why do you review this thing if you don't like it? You know why? Because it's fun. Um, I I like talking about this show much more than I do watching it. Um, <laughs> so there's one more um, episode, episode eight. That'll be next week. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking about it. Uh, gosh, I wonder what, what do you think is going to happen? Episode eight, we're going to have to tie up all sorts of things because I hear that the, they are filming the second season, but it might not show up for two years as if anyone's going to remember or care about this first season. That's a big problem right there, caring. I don't care about any of these people. I'm interested in a couple of them, all the bad ones, the bad guys, the bad women, I'm really interested in them. Other than that, there's no one. I'm, I'm not invested in anybody. If that volcano did explode and wiped them all out, that's too bad. I would be like, oh, oh well, show's over, I guess. But I wouldn't care. Do you remember Ned Stark in uh, um, Game of Thrones when Ned Stark was beheaded? Oh, my God. It was shocking, you know. And and so many of those characters, yes, you're, you're invested in them. Lord of the Rings itself, Frodo, Sam, Gandalf, all of them, you know, they, they grab your attention. You care about them. You care what's going to happen. Who do we care about in this episode, in this, not episode, in this series so far? No one. Um, what a shame. What a wasted opportunity. You know, um, I'm still truly suspicious because $2 billion, I mean, a billion dollars spent on this most expensive Series in history, an, an alleged $60 million an episode. Uh, and and what, don't you find there's something something strange about all of this? I, I'd like to know what it is. Anyway, um, I'm going to try to do, well, I will do another um, review next week. And um, maybe when it shows up, I'll do more reviews if you like these. Uh, I'm going to do the thing everybody says on YouTube. Just click like and subscribe because then, you know, you'll get, um, if you like these reviews, you'll get more of them. Thanks a lot. And again, apologize for the mm, the low technical values here. We've got, um, I'm in a cabin in New Hampshire with, uh, well, you can tell on <laughs> a little scruffy. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening.